Awesome. Welcome, everybody. My name is Carolyn Dubay. I'm the Executive Director at Fertility Matters Canada, and welcome to another ep episode of Figuring Out Fertility. I'm thrilled today to be here with Dr. Prati Sharma from Create Fertility Centre in Toronto. Uh, their centre is a huge supporter of our organization, and the topic we're going to talk about today are for, is fertility options for single women, and I'm really thrilled. Um, I was... Um, uh, privy to seeing some of this information last night. So I'm really excited about the content and to be able to bring this to you. So if you're joining on Zoom, please know that you can leave questions for Dr. Sharma in the, um, in the chat option. And if you're joining us live on Facebook, please leave them in the chat option as well. And we will have those answered live. So Dr. Sharma, I'll leave it uh, to you for a bit. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you to Fertility Matters for giving me the opportunity to present today. I think we're just in a new era of communication, and um, it's great that social media has really taken, you know, a huge stance to keep um, public education up, especially in the fertility world. So I'm really thankful for that so that our patient population can get educated and really have all their options at hand. So that brings me to the topic that we chose together for this um, forum, which is very near and dear to my heart, particularly because of what I do at the clinic, as well as some of my outside endeavors, which I can talk to you about. So um, today we'll be speaking about fertility options for single women. Um, just as a brief introduction, I'm a fertility doctor who's been practicing for um, almost 12 years in Toronto. I'm originally actually American. I um, trained in reproductive endocrinology and infertility in New York. Um, and then I married a Canadian, so here I am. Um, and some would arguably say in the time of COVID that it, this is probably a better place to be than the US. So I am thankful to be here. Um, just in terms of my experience, like I said, I'm a reproductive endocrinologist practicing in fertility care at CREATE for the last 12 years. I also have hospital appointments at Women's College in Sunnybrook, where I practice gynecology. I'm the founder of a blog called The Conception Diaries, um, which you can look up on Facebook or Instagram and find some excellent evidence-based information about all aspects of fertility medicine. Um, you know, I personally think it's a great source of information, especially with all the information there is outside on the internet. I also am um, on the medical advisory board. I headed up for a new company called Lilia, which is um, one of the new novel companies in femtech that um, does at-home fertility testing and sort of um, handholds a patient through their fertility journey, fertility care, and particularly focuses on single women, especially, who are interested in being proactive about their fertility. So I have a lot of slides, but I think they're quite informative and I'd like to make this as conversational as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and do some talking with my slides, but feel free to interrupt with questions at any time with regards to the topic at hand or relevant questions. So when I talk to single women, um, we always talk about what are your options as a woman who wants to be proactive about their fertility care. So often this starts with a discussion with a fertility doctor, a reproductive endocrinologist or RE like myself, and getting a baseline fertility history, evaluation and baseline reproductive assessment. That includes testing of your ovarian reserve. And we'll talk about why that's important because we know that women are born with a finite number of eggs. And there are ways that you can test how the eggs are functioning. And one of the options is just to say, okay, we've tested you, let's keep a close eye on your egg reserve and follow up every six months to one year and see how you're doing. The sort of opposite of that, or the next option, is to get pregnant now, either using partner sperm or donor sperm. Um, and the third option, which many um, patients are interested in, is egg freezing or embryo freezing, which we'll talk more about as well. So I think it's important to note that um, the age at which people and women are conceiving, or couples are conceiving, women are conceiving, is really going up steadily um, as time goes by. And women 35 or older account for over 10% of first-time mothers. Um, it's very common now for women to have a baby over the age of 30, and 30 to 34, and I would arguably say even over 35, is probably one of the most common categories of women who are having their first child. And so women are delaying childbearing. That's really a fact. 
what are the pros of de delaying childbearing? Well, you have more financial stability, more emotional security. Sometimes that means finding a partner later on in life. You have time to do other things before starting a family, like your career, travel, education, et cetera. Obviously, no system is perfect. And while you have time to do all those other things and potentially get that dream job and home and best you know, relationship, there are some cons to delayed childbearing. And we know that as you get older, you have more difficulty conceiving. The ovaries and the eggs get older. There's a higher risk of miscarriage and pregnancy complications. And the pure fact that you will be an older mother when you're raising children. And that can play a role when you think about having a child at 40 and maybe being 60 when they're 20. So I think about that all the time because, you know, my youngest is quite small and I'm over 40. So I always think about, you know, the stress of parenting and being an older parent when you have a young child is not to be taken lightheartedly as well. And we always talk about the biological clock. And I think, you know, women are very in tune with their um, innate health and particularly their reproductive health. And they're always thinking of time and ticking and their biological clock, which I think is actually great because they're very proactive. So looking at the idea that female fertility declines with increasing age, this is sort of the classic graph that um, is sort of published everywhere in all our textbooks and whatnot. And it shows that as women get older, their chances of having a pregnancy per month goes down significantly. And that's shown in this black line. And sort of the double whammy of all of this is that as women get older, their miscarriage risk also increases. And you can see there's sort of a sharp decline in fertility and a sharp increase in miscarriage risks around the late 30s, so over 37. And, you know, let's be honest, this is the time that patients are coming to me now to get pregnant because of all those reasons we just talked about, delayed childbearing to pursue other things. So why does egg quality decline with age? And the reason is, is that there's more chromosome abnormalities in the eggs as they age. And the reason for that is that they've been stuck in the ovary for many more years. So those eggs that have been stuck in the ovary at the age of 36, 37, 38, who've been stuck in there since you've been born, are more prone to have chromosomal errors than those eggs that are ovulated at 22, 23, 24, in your mid to late 20s that are just more healthy and have less abnormalities. So how do we go about assessing fertility potential? Well, it must be said that we don't have a perfect test to accurately predict fertility or will you get pregnant this month or will you ever get pregnant? So take all these tests with a grain of salt, but these are guides to assess what your fertility is like. And that's where we measure ovarian reserve. Um, most of these tests test for egg quantity, but they also can reflect quality. We talk about low egg supply and high egg supply, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with infertility. Everybody knows someone who knows someone who got pregnant at 44 naturally. So these are not um, sort of rules that are hard and steadfast. Predicting um, response to fertility treatment is important. Some of these tests can predict how you will do if you freeze eggs or how you will do with fertility treatment, which is very important and pre can predict the time to menopause um, or how much time you have left to conceive. So those are all important things. So the hormone tests we check to predict and see what your ovarian reserve are, are the day three FSH and estradiol levels. So hormone levels on the second or third day of your menstrual cycle. And when the FSH is elevated over 10 to 15 or the estrogen levels elevated over 150 to 200, we worry that these are signs of ovarian aging. And this is based on your biologic clock or the um, communication between your brain and your ovaries telling your ovaries to ovulate. Probably one of the best indicators of how your eggs are functioning is an ultrasound. So one of the first things we'll do if you come to the fertility clinic to have an assessment of your fertility is to do an ultrasound and measure the number of small follicles in the ovary. So this is a schematic picture of an ultrasound and all these little black circles are follicles. This person actually has a pretty decent egg count, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven or eight in each ovary. Anything over five per ovary is considered normal and less than four per ovary is considered low. So that's a pretty accurate assessment of how your ovaries and your eggs are functioning. The other hormone level, which has really gotten a lot of press over the last 10 years, is the anti-malarian hormone level, or the AMH. It's a blood test that can be done anytime during the menstrual cycle, and it's a hormone that's produced by the cells around the eggs. It's measured in the blood, and we look for a level that's between 15 and 28 to uh, indicate normal egg reserve. Anything less than 10 is considered low. Anything over 28 is considered very high. There is a cost to this test depending on where you do it in the fertility clinic outside. 
through your own um, family doctor. It's usually around the $100 to $200 range, but it is predictive of fertility for up to one year. Now, that's all tests for egg reserve or for the female, but additional testing would be if you have a partner to look at their sperm and do a semen analysis. Testing of the anatomy of the reproductive tract, which includes a hysterosalpingogram or a test of the tubes and a test of the uterus called the sonohistogram. Some women will benefit from something called preconception counseling. So if you're a woman who has other medical issues like high blood pressure or diabetes, you might benefit from seeing a high risk obstetrician to talk about if those pre-indicated medical problems can cause any problems if you actually do get pregnant and what you can do to maximize your pregnancy success. General counseling, I always highlight this because lots of single women and say, you know, okay, I'm going to get checked out, but what do I do next? I mean, I don't know. I'm in this relationship. I don't know where it's going. We might be together. We might break up. Who knows? So sometimes seeing one of our fertility social workers or counselors can really help sort of say, where is my life going? Like, how much education do I have left to do? Where is your job? At? And sort of combine all the lifestyle factors and make a decision about what's right for you in parallel with your fertility doctor. Genetic testing is also uh, an important thing to talk about. Um, now in this like scientific day and age, we have so many tests that you can do to sort of see if you're a carrier for a certain disorders that could be passed along to your child. Something called expanded carrier screening is a really new and novel test where you can see if you're a carrier for certain mutations that you might not know about and you might not know about through your family history. But if you pair up with a partner that has the same genetic mutation, your child is at risk. We also do targeted genetic testing based on ethnicity and family history. Let's say you have a family history of breast cancer, a family history of something else, or you have a certain ethnicity, you're Jewish or you're Mediterranean. There's certain tests that we would test for before you get pregnant to make sure you're not a carrier and could potentially pass along to your child. So what if you're thinking about having a baby and it's sort of option number two, which is, you know what, I think I'm ready to get pregnant now. Like, you know, this is a new era. People are having babies on their own. They're meeting people after they have a child. You know, I know I'm over 35. I'm ready to do this. Absolutely. Like more power to, the, to you. Let's do this. So most women, single women who are interested in doing this are um, using donor sperm to inseminate and have a baby. And this is all through a fertility clinic for the most part. So when you use donor sperm, there are known sperm donors and anonymous tone sperm donors. So many women will come to my office and say, I have decided to co-parent with this person, my friend, we're not in a relationship per se, but we'd like to co-parent together. So that's absolutely possible. We do need to do special testing and there are certain regulations that we follow. Only certain clinics have a known donor sperm program, Create Fertility Center being one of them. But if you do have a known donor, you need a female evaluation and the known sperm donor needs to be tested in a certain way with a semen analysis and certain blood work and certain screening tests. And then you can proceed with an insemination where we take the sperm and put it into the uterus. Anonymous donor sperm insemination is done via a sperm bank. Um, there's sperm banks in Canada as well as abroad, Europe, the US, and various distributors that bring the sperm into Canada. Um, and those sperm have been screened both genetically and with blood work and they're considered safe. Um, and those sperm donors um, donate sperm to sperm banks and it's frozen there. And you can get on the sperm bank's website, see pictures and profiles and decide what um, sperm makes sense um, for you to inseminate with. Now, how are these sperm donors screened? So screening is based on their medical, reproductive, and social history, their semen analysis to make sure they have adequate sperm, certainly infectious disease screening and psychological screening, and some genetic screening to make sure that they're appropriate. It's good to know only 1% of applicants are accepted. Um, so this is hopefully the cream of the crop that's going to potentially produce your baby. Single women always ask me, well, how do I pick a sperm donor? And I joke and say, you know, grab a couple of friends and a bottle of wine and sit down in front of the TV and uh, look at the websites. And I'm sort of half joking, but really it's based on physical features, ethnicity, education, family history, um, the donor skills and abilities. They often write a personal statement and have some audio recordings, their medical history. And really it's choosing what kind of person you'd potentially want to be, you know, genetically a parent of your child. And so, you know, women sort of go on these sites and they're able to pick a, a partner per se that makes sense for them. 
Now, how did these sperm samples get into you to make a baby? So obviously this is a joint decision with your fertility doctor after your evaluation and your ovarian reserve testing and seeing how your reproductive tract is. And then we will, as a team, decide do we just inseminate you in a natural cycle because you're young and healthy and you just need to put some sperm in? Do we need to use fertility drugs despite the risk of multiples? Or ultimately, is there a need for IVF? For women under 35, the live birth rate is actually quite good. It's just like, you know, going out to the world and having in, in, having intercourse, except we're putting the sperm in the uterus for you. Um, obviously, as a woman ages, the success rates do decline, as expected with any sort of natural fertility. And the cost is about $1,000 to $1,500 per cycle, depending on what kind of treatment you do. The way we do an IUI is like a pap smear. We put a speculum in and it's essentially a small straw that goes into the cervix and the uterus and we um, put the sperm in. Nothing really should hurt. Um, you know, although pap smears are not comfortable, it is a test that's not um, unreasonable. It's, it's very simple. It is usually associated with cycle monitoring where we monitor the cycle to see when you're ovulating. So we talked about fertility evaluation, testing of the ovarian reserve, and we talked about getting pregnant now. So the third option is egg freezing and embryo freezing. So before I go on here and, and talk about egg freezing, and you know, I have this like post up back from 2014 about how Facebook and Apple said they would pay for egg freezing for their employees. I think that was really like a big breakthrough in business and fertility medicine because it really allowed women to be empowered and say, you know what, I can pursue my career and sort of put my eggs on ice and my company will actually help me pay for it and supports me. So Carolyn, before I continue, um, any questions from the um, Facebook world or anyone have any questions or concerns or want to discuss anything to date? Ben? um that's come in and they're curious to know if we go back to um for that first set of slides uh, that we were talking about when would a woman know when she could go in for should go in for the testing for amh or, or how would she start those conversations would that be with her family doctor um, and at what age maybe would someone be considering going in for those types of tests yeah, well, the beauty with fertility testing now is that because it's so overt and patients are like talking about it all over, I say there's no wrong age to get evaluated. Um, you know, I see 27 year old women who are entering medical school and know it's a long road ahead with medicine, residency, fellowship, and they know they're not going to conceive for a while. And we'll get to this in my slides, but the younger that you pursue egg freezing, the better the statistics are. And and so coming in when you're young just for a baseline assessment is always good. Certainly, you know, the, the types of patients that come in run the band, gambit. I mean, there's also the patient who's 38 and maybe was in a relationship and it didn't work out. And, you know, she thought she was going to get married and have kids and it didn't work. And now she's thinking about egg freezing or donor sperm insemination. So I always say there's no wrong age. Don't think you're too young. Um, usually patients will start the conversation with their family doctor because you do need a referral to see a fertility doctor. So that's usually where patients start. And I love that this in this day and age, family doctors are now so open open and responsive. In the past, I would see family doctors kind of saying, oh, you're too young. Don't worry. Don't worry. But they're so um, on top of this as well that they're very ready and willing to um, send a referral over for a fertility assessment. So um, I would say start with your family doctor. Um, companies like the one I'm involved with, Lilia, um, for patients who maybe feel a little awkward to come into a fertility clinic because they think, well, I don't know what I'm doing yet. You know, these companies allow for at home fertility testing of your AMH. It's just a pinprick that you do on your own. Um, and then you send the test back to the company and your results come back in, you know, a couple days at most. They're reviewed by myself with Lily as a fertility doctor. And you can have a follow-up phone consult with the fertility doctor just to discuss your results, like your preliminary findings. And then and depending on what you want to do, you can come in for a full evaluation with the fertility doctor. So that's a way to do it sort of without sort of going through the whole family doctor referral process. But it's always a good discussion to have with your family doctor because those are the people that know you best. Um, and then if you come direct to the fertility doctor, we sort of get the whole picture and you can do your assessment right there. Awesome. Hey, thank you for answering that. I think, yeah. and I think that's all for now. So we can... Okay, great. So um, let's talk about the big buzzword of egg freezing. Um, you know, I'm always overjoyed to see egg freezing patients because 
again, it just shows like female power and that women are really embracing their fertility and, you know, thinking about themselves and deciding what's important in their lives and sort of not tying it to having children right away. It also gets their foot in the door to sort of have all their options at hand. So uh, many women do come to me to talk about egg freezing. So when we talk about egg freezing, what we're talking about is oocyte cryopreservation. preservation. I hardly ever say oocyte cryopreservation. I usually say egg freezing. So it's a big word even for me, but it's basically the method that we use to preserve reproductive potential in women. So eggs are harvested from your ovaries after you take fertility drugs for about two weeks. They're frozen, unfertilized, um, and stored for later use. A frozen egg can be thawed at any given time later on, combined with sperm in the laboratory and implanted back into your uterus when you're ready. This does happen using the assisted reproductive technique called in vitro fertilization. And that might seem like it's obvious, but I do always state that to my patients because for some reason they think egg freezing because I'm not a fertility patient is not the same as IVF, but it is. You are doing an IVF cycle where you take medication and we take the eggs out of your body and freeze them in the lab. So who should freeze eggs? That kind of goes along with the question you were asking, Carolyn. So women who want to delay childbearing for any reason, and you know, really that reason probably should not matter. A patient can have a personal choice for any reason to delay her fertility, but often this is for career, you know, emotional and financial security, having a partner, um, pursuing traveling or personal interests. Those women who are single and um, are you know, waiting to find Mr. or Miss Wright um, and want to preserve their fertility while they're young. Women in relationships who are not sure whether they want to have children in the future. And I find this is a big category. There's a lot of couples who say, well, I am going to be with this guy, but we just don't know if we want to have kids or not. And obviously, you know, people's priorities change. They think about what they want and, you know, people want different things at different stages in life. And sometimes it's, oh, I don't want kids, but my partner wants kids, so we want that option. And we have to face the reality that, you know, relationships are changing these days. Um, women can, or men can be with someone who they are with for two years, and then all of a sudden that ends and they're in a new relationship. It's just the facts of life. So um, it's, it's great to have these options so that, you know, whatever happens, you're okay. Um, single women who are not ready to conceive without a partner. So you might be thinking about a baby, but you don't want to have a baby with donor sperm, and that's a personal choice. So women undergoing medical treatment that may significantly reduce their fertility. So whether that's cancer treatment or surgery for um, an ovarian cyst or some other thing that can reduce your fertility, that's another reason to preserve your fertility before you do undergo treatment. Typically, we see this in our cancer population or patients who have chronic diseases that need to undergo some sort of therapy that's debilitating to fertility. Ideally, younger women do better because they have more eggs and more healthy eggs. So again, why should I freeze my eggs? There's a lot I want to do before I have kids and all the reasons that we talked about. Egg freezing is really becoming more mainstream, it's accessible, and many private insurances and some com companies will um, help um, pay for egg freezing, at least for the medication. And the success rate of frozen eggs is increasing just in the last couple of weeks as an anecdote. Um, I've had a couple of patients just in the last week who thawed their frozen eggs and they have these amazing results creating embryos at an older age and they're getting pregnant. My patient walking around right now has twins from when she froze eggs at 38 at 44, which is awesome. So um, it is quite possible and quite successful. So when we talk about egg freezing, I thought I'd list some questions that come to mind that are probably in our audience's mind. What are the risks, short and long term? What are the costs? What is the hormone treatment all about and how will I feel? Are they injections? Will they hurt? Tell me about the egg retrieval. Will the eggs survive the thaw? What is the success rate? How are the eggs frozen and how long can they remain frozen? And what if I never use these eggs because I get pregnant naturally, which ideally is the best case, best case scenario. So all of our stimulation protocols go back to the natural menstrual cycle and a modification of the natural menstrual cycle. Or as I say, as reproductive endocrinologists, we kind of take advantage of the menstrual cycle and understanding the menstrual cycle to be able to manipulate it to do these sorts of things that we do in our laboratories and in our clinics. So just in a normal menstrual cycle, what happens is, is in the first half of the cycle, you develop an egg, the lining of the uterus develops, you ovulate that egg through the fallopian tube. And if you get pregnant, then the egg Egg, the egg or the fertilized egg implants in the uterus. If not, the egg in the lining are released and you get your period. And this is just a picture of the menstrual cycle on the right as well. 
So what happens during ovarian stimulation and IVF? So this is a schematic of what will happen to you if you do an IVF cycle or the typical protocol that must, most women undergo. Day one, you get your period and you come in on day two or three and you start injections of FSH and LH. That usually goes on for about 10 days. The daily injections are happening at home for the most part, although you can come into the clinic for daily injections if you don't wanna do them on your own, but most women are able to do them on their own. They're typically either in the tummy subcutaneous or in the bum. After those 10 days of injections, now you are coming in for monitoring for ultrasounds and blood work to see how you're responding. After those injections and we say, oh, the eggs are ready, there's you know X number and they're at the right size, you get a trigger to trigger ovulation. And 35 to 36 hours later, we do an egg retrieval around the middle of your expected menstrual cycle where we retrieve the eggs. Some patients might take birth control pills or a hormone treatment before the cycle to help synchronize the egg growth and stimulation is approximately 10 to 12 days. Monitoring happens about every other day with an ultrasound and blood work at the clinic and the egg retrieval is under sedation. And when you're asleep, um, I or a fertility doctor would go in through the vagina and poke the ovaries, you're asleep so you don't feel anything, and retrieve the eggs into a test tube. This is another schematic of how we get them out. Um, this picture on the right, and I hope everyone can see it because I have a screen up with everybody um, from the Zoom call up, but um, this is an ultrasound picture of how the ovaries look at the time of the egg retrieval, where these little black circles, if you compare that to the antral follicle picture I showed you in the beginning, are the fluid-filled sacs with the eggs on them. And I can only hope that all the patients who do egg freezing look like this and have a lot of eggs. Low complication rate, less than 1% risk of bleeding, infection, or damage to nearby structures during the egg retrieval. Rare, but you know we have to mention these to any patients that undergo the procedure. So these are what eggs look like under the microscope. This black dot you would see when you're doing your egg retrieval in the camera. Those are the oocytes of the eggs and this gray tissue around the eggs is um, cumulus cells or the cells that sort of protect the eggs that come out when we take them out. So what is considered a good egg? Well, the embryologists look at the morphology and that's what the eggs look like under the microscope. And they should be clear and colorless. They should have like a synchronized nuclear and cytoplasmic ratio, no major granules inside the um, gray part. You know, I leave this up to the experts in the lab to say what eggs are best, but they know what they're doing. No genetic testing is done on the eggs themselves. We only do genetic testing once we thaw the eggs and we fertilize, there's an option there to test them. So ultimately, how do you tell if it was a good egg? And I tell patients, listen, if you're young, you should have a majority of good eggs. But the best way to tell is once you thaw them, if they fertilize and create a good looking embryo, and ideally they create a viable pregnancy when you put the embryo back into the uterus. So how does the lab freeze my eggs? And probably the most important um, term to know here is vitrification, which is really the standard way that eggs are frozen across the world in most um, sort of avant-garde centers. Um, it's really the newest flash freezing process. The older method, slow freezing, has fallen out of favor, not as good survival rates and pregnancy rates. It's basically using rapid cooling and warming using high levels of cryoprotectin, so there's less ice crystal formation in the eggs. Um, this is really essentially what all the good egg freezing labs do, and there's um, really good success rates for live births. A word on embryo freezing, um, and I mentioned this to all my patients, even though egg freezing has really come a long way and success rates with the thaw are quite high now, they're not gonna be as good as embryos because embryos have gone a few days further in the process. We've taken out the eggs, we've fertilized them, and we've actually created embryos. And those do freeze and thaw better than eggs do. And we can also do genetic testing on those embryos if we wanted to, especially for those women over 35 and particularly 37. Um, some women who have a lot of eggs will opt to do 50% eggs and 50% sperm, especially let's say if they have a partner that they're not sure of what's gonna happen with that partner, they freeze some embryos with him and they freeze some eggs so that if they break up, they have those left over. So lots of options and you can certainly talk to your fertility doctor. The cons of freezing embryos are that they're already combined with a donor or partner sperm and you can't split them up again. So important to consider. So is IVF and egg freezing safe? A really common and great question. Well, 
the first IVF treatment was performed on Louise Brown, who many people know of. She's the first IVF baby and she's now 42 years old and healthy. And, you know, she shows up at many of our conferences and talks about how she was the first quote unquote test tube baby. So she's our like guiding light in terms of safety. But the truth is we've done more than 10,000 IVF cycles in Canada, more than 200,000 in the US and lots and lots of live births. Um, many, many centers all over the US and Canada and North America and certainly worldwide. The first reported egg freezing pregnancy was in 1986, so it's been a while. Lots of births from egg freezing, lots of egg, egg banks freezing eggs. So although it's a relatively new technology when we think about medical treatment in general, like the development of penicillin was in the early 1900s, it's considered quite safe and there's no studies that show an increase in birth defects or problems with the pregnancy in women who use frozen eggs as opposed to people who conceive naturally or with a fresh IVF. Although it's important to note that age plays the most important role and that any IVF pregnancy has some slight increased risk of birth defects and placental abnormalities. But like I said, so much IVF is done worldwide now. Um, we quote the birth defect rate to maybe be a percentage or two higher than with um, natural conceptions. So should I freeze my eggs? Well, what we say is, in an ideal world, you need at least eight to 10 mature eggs. And I would extend that to say that 15 to 20 is really the ideal number. Younger eggs are better. And what we say is, if you are under 36 and you can get 15 to 20 eggs, whether that's over one or multiple cycles, you probably have a very good chance, over 60% chance of having a baby from those eggs. If you do a cycle and you only have four or five eggs, or you're older than 36, then you have to consider doing more than one cycle or consider the fact that you're gonna have a lower success rate. And that again goes back to the fact that age is the most important predictor of fertility. And that's why I say, Carolyn, going back to your original question that younger age is always better when it comes to fertility. And that holds true even for fertility preservation or egg freezing. The younger you are, the better the success rate. Um, and these are just slides from sort of the guru of egg freezing, Anna Cobo in Spain. Her laboratory, um, EV, has been responsible for producing data on egg freezing for the last, you know, five, 10 years. And what they showed is that the highest success rate is probably at the ages of 30 to 34 or under 35. And the lowest success rate is over 40. So the younger you are when you freeze your eggs, the better. So oftentimes women will come to me and say, well, but Dr. Sharma, I'm 32 and all the numbers look good. My AMH is good. My egg count is good. So can I wait two years? I mean, you absolutely can and you'll probably do okay, but your 32 year old eggs are probably gonna be more healthy than your 34 year old eggs. So think about that when you decide on your timeline. So how many eggs can you expect? So when you look at this graph, this is going from 30 to 45 or this table, the number of eggs you can expect is gonna dramatically go down as you get older. So again, less than 35, you can probably get your 16 eggs in one cycle. Over 37, you're probably gonna need a second cycle and that plays a role when it comes to timing, investment, financial investment, time at the clinic and all the hormone injections. So if you can do it in one cycle, it's always better. So younger age is better. Obviously this all depends on your ovarian reserve. If you have higher ovarian reserve, you're gonna get more eggs in one cycle as well. So what are the side effects? I think patients, especially young women who are also busy working and you know, obviously as women, we are concerned about our um, weight gain and our appearance and how we feel at work and maybe we don't want our employers and our friends to know that we're undergoing this process so side effects are important and you know I think it's very important to discuss these with patients so the most common things I hear patients talking about in terms of the drugs and the injections are bloating headache breast tenderness injection site tenderness sometimes upset stomachs nausea and some mood swings most of the time these are minor and tolerable for two weeks um, so patients tolerate them well, and they do resolve once you have your egg retrieval and you get your period. But those are really the common um, side effects during the stimulation. When it comes to risks, if you take fertility drugs to actually conceive, the biggest risk is probably multiple pregnancy. And then in terms of more severe side effects with the fertility drugs, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome or overstimulating or making too many eggs and having lots of bloating requiring you know, fluid aspirations and whatnot, thankfully much less common now due to our novel protocols, but it is something to be considered and it happens in probably 1% of our cases. Like I said, most patients tolerate fertility drugs well with minimal side effects and our current protocols allow for shorter stimulation times, lower doses and lower risks, which is wonderful. 
So should I be worried about OHSS? Again, another buzzword when it comes to egg freezing and IVF. Well, yes, especially if you're freezing eggs at 28, 29, 32, when you have lots and lots of eggs and you're going to be a high responder, for sure. It's not something to be taken lightly. But as a fertility doctor, we're super conscious of fertility uh, treatment and OHSS. And we, you know, watch you closely. That's why you're doing monitoring. We drop your dose if we need. We trigger with certain um, triggers that reduce the risk. We watch you closely afterwards if needed. And you have fluid in your pelvis, we'll drain you afterwards. Um, Thankfully, although mild hyperstimulation can occur in 20% of cycles, severe is in less than 2%, so it is rare. And so while we quote it as a risk, thankfully, it's, it's usually in a small population of patients. So who gets OHSS and how can it be prevented? Well, young women with high and egg counts, high AMH levels, those with PCOS or a history of OHSS, high estrogen levels, um, use of an HCG trigger, so we try to avoid that in a large number of follicles, either stimulated or retrieved. So we use certain protocols to avoid this. And, you know, we know a high responder when we look at them. We know who's going to be at risk, and we try to mitigate those risks as much as possible. Prevention is the key, and our goal is to have an OHSS-free clinic. So we use all kinds of tricks in our um, sleeve to avoid OHSS. So I tell my patients, listen, you can be worried about it, but you don't need to be up at night about it because we got your back. We're watching you for risks. And, um, you know, even if you get OHSS, most of the patients can be managed conservatively and don't need to go to the hospital. So, okay, now you've frozen your eggs. You've made that decision to go ahead. You've done the stimulation. You managed without OHSS. You did it at 32 and now you're 38, no partner, and you want to use your eggs. So what do you do? Well, We'll do an up-to-date evaluation. If there's a partner around, we'll check their sperm. If there's not, we'll talk about donor sperm. We do an anatomy check to make sure you're good to um, carry a pregnancy and check the uterus. We always go through a discussion process about whether we should use the frozen eggs or we should try with your fresh eggs at whatever age you are. Should we do a new cycle of IVF? Should we try insemination? Um, we choose donor sperm if there's no partner. If there's a partner, we test them. If we are going ahead with um, using the frozen eggs, we thaw them. We fertilize them using a technique called ICSI. We usually thaw all of the eggs because we don't know how many will make, that, make it to an embryo stage. We culture the embryos. We consider genetic testing of the embryos, and we typically transfer one or two into the uterus and hopefully get a pregnancy. And this picture shows injecting the egg with the sperm here. And this is a picture of PGS, which is once this beautiful embryo is created, we can sample some cells from the embryo to test the embryo and see if it's genetically normal, particularly important in older women. Now, the big question, what is the cost of egg freezing? Unfortunately, unless you have a medical issue that prevents you or will keep you from being able to get pregnant in the future, and it needs to be something quite serious like cancer or um, a medical condition where you'll be on medication that basically disrupts your fertility, it is unfortunately not covered by OHIP. The cost varies from center to center, but typically it's about six to $10,000 for the IVF. And the drugs, depending on how much you need, are between two and $5,000 per cycle. Some private insurances do cover. Um, the storage fee for your eggs is about three to $500 per year. Again, that's clinic dependent. And the cost to thaw and fertilize the eggs varies from five to $8,000 with genetic testing being an extra cost of around $5,000. Um, some employers are willing to write a letter to insurance companies to consider coverage for the cycle. Certainly check with your um, employer and see if that would be possible. So, you know, an important question to ask is what if I never use my eggs? Like I have 29, 30 year old women who freeze their eggs and then, you know, life happens. They meet their lifetime partner and they get pregnant naturally with their two or three kids. Well, Ideally, your eggs are an insurance policy and you don't have to use them. I mean, even though it's expensive, we want them to be there if you need them. But if you can conceive naturally, that's always wonderful. You can keep them indefinitely. And I tell patients this with frozen eggs or frozen embryos. Everyone's heard unfortunate stories where, you know, patients have children and God forbid something happens or they, you know, get divorced and there's a second marriage and they're older and they wish they had eggs to use for, um, you know, getting partner, pregnant with their new partner. So many different things can arise. If you decide, no, I'm definitely done with my eggs or embryos. I have my kids. I'm good or whatever the situation might be. You can either donate them anonymously or by directed donation to someone of your choice. Um, we do have an egg and embryo donation program at CREATE and certain other clinics have those programs. You can donate them to research. Um, you know, clinics like ours are doing tons and tons of research on 
anonymous, so we wouldn't attach your name to the samples, eggs and embryos to really further our knowledge in reproductive health and hopefully help predict which eggs and embryos are really going to be the ones that make it. Um, and you can always opt to discard your eggs and um, they will be discarded in an um, ethical way so that they're not used by anyone and disposed of. Um, so really, in the end, is it worth it? Should I invest in egg freezing? Well, the pros are it's an insurance policy. And for young single women, um, you know, I find that psychologically you have that idea in your head. I want to get pregnant. And when you meet someone, it's always that idea in my head. Oh my gosh, is this going to be the one that I'm going to have a child with? And that's a lot of pressure. Sometimes I find women shorten the duration of a relationship because they think I need to go, 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 get married and have kids. And so by doing this and freezing eggs, it actually just lessens the burden when you meet someone and maybe gives you a little bit more time to decide, is this the right person for me? Um, and in addition to those other like thoughts of, you know, you can pursue medical school, you can go to business school and just say, you know what, I did this egg freezing, so I can pursue my career and my education for a while, or I can uh, achieve financial stability, like maybe you want a house and, you know, some more money in the bank before you have a baby, understandably so, it costs a lot of money to raise kids. Um, you know, so insurance policy makes sense. Um, the other pros are, you know, if you wait till an older age, you might need three IVF cycles to get pregnant. Well, if you have younger eggs, you could use those and get pregnant more easily. The technology and safety profile is improving and the success rates are great. Reduces stress and worry about your biological clock, as we said, and it buys time to do other things in life first. The cons are obviously cost. Cost is important and um, $10,000 is not a low fee, especially if you have to do more than one cycle. We don't because this is a relatively new technique. We don't have long-term data on kids who are 20, 25 years old and born from egg freezing, but we can extrapolate a lot from just IVF, which has been done for you know, 30, 40 years now, and the safety profile has been well established. Yes, you may never use those eggs, but I can't tell you how many patients sit in my office and say, I wish I froze my eggs. And so those are things to think about. It's a personal and individualized choice that you should make with your support system, your friends and family who um, you want to be involved, um, certainly your fertility doctor and perhaps your family doctor who knows you well. And I would certainly also advocate for speaking to a counselor to discuss whether it's right for you. So if you are ready to go ahead, at least with a fertility evaluation, what do I do next? Um, you can get a referral from your primary doctor to a fertility clinic. Of course, I'm going to put in a plug for myself, Prathi Sharma at Create. I'm happy to see new referrals for um, general fertility assessment or for egg freezing or fertility preservation. Um, would love that. You can contact um, our company, uh, Lilia, for in-home fertility testing. Our CEO, Alyssa Atkins, is very uh, committed to um, helping women empower themselves about their fertility. Um, discussion and evaluation with a reproductive endocrinologist like myself, consider all your options, egg freezing, monitoring your ovarian reserve, or maybe it's time to get pregnant now. Um, you can certainly meet with the business team at the clinic to understand the costs involved, check with your insurance regarding coverage, and certainly think about your timeline and when it would be the easiest in your schedule, you know, what your timeline is to having a baby, and so on and so forth. So keep calm and carry on. The whole purpose of seminars like this is really to reduce stress and give women options and empower them with the knowledge and the tools to make the right next step choices and decisions. So figuring out your options and best choice is not easy. And you know, I thank you again at Fertility Matters for having these um, engaging seminars to really reach out to couples and patients who are looking to learn about their fertility. Make sure you have all of the accurate information to make the best choice for you. It's always better to see a fertility doctor for an evaluation sooner rather than later. So there's no age that we say no. If you have a partner, speak with them about all the options if you feel open and have them meet the fertility doctor with you. Even if they may not be participating in the process, they are your support system. When considering insemination with donor sperm, consider your timeline, finances, career, childcare needs, um, because childcare is important and future relationship potential carefully prior to proceeding. When you consider egg freezing, keep in mind the cost, your commitment during the IVF cycle and the timeline and future pregnancy planning. And a fertility counselor can always offer additional insight. So I thank you all very much. 
I would like to thank the Conception Diaries team. That's my blog. Please check it out. Um, EMD Serono, who is um, our support for Conception Diaries, um, Three Month Right. I should also add here that um, Fairing Fertility, and sorry, it's not on my thank you slide, but Fairing Fertility actually helped me a lot in setting up this talk with Fertility Matters. So I thank them for giving me the opportunity to connect with you guys um, and actually um, speak about this engaging topic. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Crystal Chan, um, some of the slides here were informational from her as well, so I'd like to give her credit. The Fertility Matters team, um, the CEO at Lilia and the Lilia team, Alyssa Atkins, and please do follow us at The Conception Diaries. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram and online on the web. Um, Lilia's website is www.hellolilia.com. Our website, createfertility.com. Um, you can follow myself um, on Conception Diaries or on my um, professional Facebook page, Dr. Prati Sharma, and on my Instagram. In terms of referrals, feel free for your family doctor, or you can send an email yourself to our clinic manager, Debbie, at debd at createivf.com, or my personal assistant at the clinic, Melanie, melanie at createivf.com. Thank you so much, and I'm open to any questions anyone may have. Amazing. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, Dr. Sharma, if you unshare your screen, can you do sure. that? Stop sharing. Yes, and then, I, I then you it. and I can have a, there we go. Perfect. You and I can have a conversation. We've got lots of people who are joining here live. Perfect. Um, thank you. That was jam packed with information. And I am, um, as much as I think I know, I always learn so much listening to these talks. So I jotted down a few notes for myself. Great. Yeah, so we do have some questions that have come in, and I'd love to uh, get, we've got about 10 minutes, just about 10 minutes, so we've got time sure. for questions. So, Wonderful. Um, one question from Facebook, what causes AMH to go up? Well, I mean, I'd love if all my patients' AMHs just went up and up, but I mean, the the dogma is that as you get older, AMH levels are going to go down. That's just reproductive physiology. Now, mind you, with any lab test, there is a range of levels. So sometimes I see a patient's AMH be 14 one month and 16 six months later. So, you know, that's normal lab variation. Um, so women always ask if I take all these supplements like CoQ10 and DHEA, will I see a rise in my AMH? I mean, it's not unheard of, but generally speaking, what your AMH is will last for a year and over time it is going to go down. So, you know, like I said, I would love it if AMH just went up, um, each time I checked it for patients, but in general, the trend is a downward trend with age. Great. Thank you for, for, um, and, and is there anything that a patient can do to increase their AMH. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, there's all these fertility supplements, many that have data to support them, like coenzyme Q10, you know, some loose data. DHEA has some loose data. Um, if you talk to a naturopath, there's many things that have some data that might support acupuncture and whatnot, but there's no data-driven supplements that are going to say that take this and your AMH will go up. Okay. There's just some data that maybe they might loosely support your fertility, but no, there's no, no particular medication you can take to make your AMH go up. And that's why we use AMH as a guide saying, you know, if your AMH is low, pursue fertility treatment sooner. Great. Um, so we have some questions also that have come in through Zoom. Okay. What's the process and cost of checking ovarian reserve? Right. So generally speaking, if you want a full assessment for ovarian reserve, then that would be coming into studio fertility doctor. And in Ontario, the um, consult is covered by OHIP. AMH blood tests are not covered by OHIP at this point. So as I mentioned, the cost in our clinic is $95, and you could do that when you come for your com consultation. The pelvic ultrasound and the antral follicle count is also covered by OHIP, and that's part of the initial assessment. If you do one of these at-home AMH tests, it is a little bit more because of the convenience of doing it in your own home. It's about $200. And if your family doctor orders the AMH through Gamma Dynacare or a local laboratory, it's going to be about the same as well, about $95. So AMH testing is not covered. It's, like I said, around 100. Um, but most of the fertility assessment is covered by OHIP when you come in to be seen unless you need any additional testing. Great. And so with the ovarian reserve testing, is there a, 
an ultrasound that happens there too? Or is it a yes. blood test or what's yes. that look like? So, so when we look at ovarian reserve, it's it's sort of a package of three things. One is the ultrasound and the antrophollicle count. So the pelvic ultrasound and the antrophollicle count, the blood test, the AMH, and usually we'll also do day three FSH and estrogen levels. But doing an AMH alone is probably a good start mm-hmm. um, if a patient just wants to do a blood test to see what her fertility is like and doesn't want to come into the fertility clinic. But as a fertility doctor, I would say it's best to get the full evaluation because that way you can look for other things like, are there any cysts in the ovaries? How does the uterus look? And then talk about all the options as well. Of course. And and that's an internal ultrasound? Correct. It's an internal ultrasound that's vaginal. That being said, for those patients who might be virginal or not comfortable, we can do it abdominally and get an assessment as well. It is possible. Okay, great. Uh, another question that has come in. I have a known donor in the USA. Yep. Uh, can I come to the USA rather, or can I go to the USA rather than him traveling to Canada? Do you have a... Oh, I think someone was confused because you had said that you were in New York, but Uh, you are in Canada now. Yes, yes, yes. No, I'm in Canada. So, I mean, I should probably preempt all of this by saying that COVID has made things a little tricky. But um, if there's a known donor in the U.S., in non-COVID times, we could certainly say that they could be screened in Canada and provide sperm and we could freeze it and use it for insemination. But now in COVID times, they would have to come and be quarantined for two weeks before they enter the clinic. But all of these things are possible. Like if you have a sperm donor in the U S and they, and you would like to inseminate through our clinic in Canada, certainly they could um, come here and, you know, quarantine for two weeks and then get all their testing done and freeze sperm. And we could use that for insemination. Alternatively, like our clinic is preparing a kit to ship to the U.S. that we could get people to produce sperm at home and send it over to Canada. That's sort of in the works still. Or certainly if they're in the U.S., um, a Canadian can go to the U.S. and get treatment there as well. But again, these are all tricky things that are happening in the era of COVID. So those roles are changing every day. Of course. So best to connect with a fertility specialist, talk about those options and make the best decision for you. I mean, I would say if that patient is, uh, that person is, uh, the woman is in Canada, the first best step would be to see a fertility doctor here, or if they're in the U.S., to see a fertility doctor there and just get a baseline evaluation and talk about the options. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Does CREATE do twilight sedation? I'm not familiar with that term. Yeah, yeah. No, the sedation that we do for all our procedures is twilight, if I'm understanding correctly. And it's an IV where you're conscious. So it's conscious sedation or twilight. And that's where there's no breathing tube down your throat. Um, You're breathing on your own. Some women are actually quite comfortable and awake and looking at their eggs during an egg retrieval. Most women want to be sedated where they're sleeping. So yes, in a nutshell, it is twilight sedation. Great. Can you get an appointment uh, at fertility clinics for a consult without a referral? So I know that that question actually will depend on which province you live in. Probably, yes. Mm. I mean, I will say you do ultimately need a referral, um, and a lot of it's for billing purposes, um, and it's just, you know, how the OMA and OHIP works. Mm -hmm. But... um, Interestingly, if you, and we had to circumvent this issue a little bit with our company, Lilia, because those patients were coming through a company and not through a family doctor, and they sort of have a family doctor on staff that provides the referrals. But honestly, even a walk-in clinic is very willing to provide a referral um, for fertility care. Um, So it's generally not hard, but it does have to be a allopathic doctor. It can't be a naturopath or someone without a CPSO license. But yes, to be the simple answer is you do need a referral. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, But oftentimes if you contact the clinic, like if you contact my secretary, she can get you all sorted out, set up the appointment and the referral can follow. Right. That's it. And that was, um, they can connect with Deb or Melanie at at Create. Perfect. how, did we talk, I forget now, do we talk about, we did talk about how, a question came in, how much was egg freezing, but we did cover that in the leader's We did slide. cover that. Again, it's about six to $10,000. In our clinic, it's $6,500 for an egg freezing cycle. Okay. It does not, that does not include the medication. So if you have medication coverage, then it's 6,500 and that includes the first year of storage. If you do not have medication coverage, then you have to put out about three to $4,000 for the drugs. So then it would be about a $10,000 endeavor. And then annual storage is $375 a year. 
Great, perfect. Uh, I'm just double checking here on our Facebook. Is there anything, while well, I'm just checking for last qu minute questions that have come in, anything in closing that you'd like to say? Um, you know, I think that this is really a new era. I think, you know, especially in the time of COVID, you know, people, single women especially, are probably not meeting uh, people and going out on dates and whatnot. And so your fertility is something that you might be more nervous about. And so this is the time fertility clinics are open. We're doing consultations. Yes, they're mostly by telemedicine, but we are bringing in patients for consultations um, to get their ultrasounds and blood work. So now is the time to be seen and think about these options. We are running IVF cycles. So you absolutely can freeze your eggs. And, you know, I, I see a lot of women who say, oh, I've been thinking about this for a couple of years, but only now did I come in. Like seize the opportunity and come in. It's always best to be armed with information, even if it's, if it's just to say, okay, my fertility is pretty good and I know what my options are. So we'd love to see you here. Absolutely. I think that the information you provided today really helps to normalize the feelings that some women will be feeling about um, you know, their biological clock ticking, or if they've seen more of these buzzwords, how, what does it mean? Sh is that something I should be looking into? We hear that from yeah. patients, you know, yeah. um, in our support groups. Why uh, is this something I need to be considering? How old did I miss the boat? Those types totally. of things. So thank you for helping to normalize the conversation. Um, thank you for reminding us that talking about our reproductive health early, late, at all stages is super important. Yep, absolutely. Um, but there are that. experts out there uh, who really want to connect and help you make the decisions to um, maximize your reproductive chances and help you with your future family building. So thank you for all of that information. It was incredibly important. Um, thank you. All of you that have, that have um, been watching on our Zoom and on our Facebook, whether you're live or watching the replay of this video, uh, thank you for chiming in. If you have any questions um, that you'd like to have answered, please don't hesitate to reach out to Fertility Matters. We can always connect with Dr. Sharma to have those questions answered for you. Absolutely. This will be live on our YouTube and our Facebook channel and eventually uploaded for Instagram as well. And I'd really like to take the opportunity to thank Faring Pharmaceuticals for making this session, um, for connecting us and for allowing us to bring this session to you, this information that's invaluable. Um, they're a huge supporter of this organization of patient care in Canada, and um, we thank them for their generous help. So, um, thank you to Faring as well. Yes, and so to all of you, thank you for joining, and join us again next week for another edition of Figuring Out Fertility and Dr. Sharma. Have a wonderful week, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping me with the setup, and glad it all worked out. It Take care, great. everyone. Have a great thank day. You. Take care.